At first glance, this is just a tired old car. On the outside, it's filthy. All four of its tires are flat and the brake rotors have turned to rust. But under all this stone dust is a time capsule. Now this Corvette was just delivered a little bit after 10 at night from the salvage auction where I bought it sight unseen for just scrap value. It was listed as an in-op, meaning it's completely dead and was written off as flood total. The next morning, I anxiously got to work under the hood, which had an unkempt look like the rest of the car. When I pulled the oil dipstick, I found the level to be spot on. No water mixed in at all, and the oil itself even looked fresh. The transmission dipstick, the same, with cherry red fluid all the way up to the full mark. But where I think this car's story really starts to unfold is here in the cabin. Everything looks, feels, and smells brand new. The seats are hardly creased. The carpet's super clean. The dashboard and steering wheel have virtually no wear. In the center console is a set of records which further paint a clear image of this car's life, and we'll review those in just a moment but right now, I'm convinced this Corvette wasn't really flooded. I pulled up my truck, hooked up some jumper cables, and watched things come to life. Only God knows how long it's been since someone has been in this car or attempted to start it. Listen to that. Nice chime. There you go. 4,000 510 miles. The screen's really dim. Let's see. I'm gonna get in. Here we go. Now this generation and a lot of other Corvettes have front post battery connections, so it's very finicky to jumpstart. Probably why we didn't get a solid crank just now, but I went in the field and borrowed a battery out of my other Corvette and hooked it up directly so we could give it another shot. All right, we're all connected. It's a chance that this thing just fires right up. Let's see. Nope, it's not firing right up. That's a, it's got no gas in it, yeah? There's no way it's gonna be as easy as filling it up, is there? It's just how grimy every inch of this car is. For five, less than 5,000 miles. Right here, I'm just gonna put in a bottle of uh, water remover, because it's been sitting so long, obviously. That's also injector cleaner. And then I've got about two gallons of gas here. We don't wanna fill it up too, too much. Let's see. You know, they don't make them like they used to. I'm not talking about this old Corvette, I'm talking about the gas cans. The crank here sounds awesome. It's nice and even, but this car's not even trying to fire. So I brought over a bit of starting fluid and we began to hear the sweet sound of progress. So we moved the Corvette closer to everything else out here. So we have access to our tools and everything easier. It sounded like it wanted to start on that starting fluid, but it's difficult when you're only one man to shoot the starting fluid and crank. So we got Mike in the driver's seat here. We're gonna check fuel pressure first off and see if we've got any at the rail. 14, let's go. Ready? Yep. Three, two, one. All right, we're good. Well, we know it runs. Yep. Okay. Now we come back here. Mike, get that gross finger out of the shot. Now that should come up and out. There we go. And that's one of the best parts about these C4 Corvettes is when you're working on the fuel systems, literally all you do is take that door off and then I could show you a little bit easier here on the ZR1 because I have it off. 
couple bolts and literally the entire pump and sending unit comes up and out of the car. With it up and out of the car, we can get a clear view of what's going on in that fuel tank. I'm wondering if we're gonna see a bunch of varnish in here. Sounds a little crispy. There's a lot of gas in there, it looks like. Is the pump submerged? Well, take it out, you're gonna find out. I was worried about the oh, microphone. Okay, oh, wow. there's that your problem. Nasty. Yeah, there's your problem. We can, get can you just... get that finger out of the shot, please? The finger needs to get out of the shot. <laughs> Why? <laughs> just crop it out. People are going to think that I caused the finger, okay? They're going to go, he's got unsafe working conditions. Oh, like, my goodness. Uh, there it is. That's our problem, okay? Well, that's the beginning of our problem. There's probably... A, a good amount more where that all came from. We need to see down in there. And the quick, easy, and reliable way of fixing this is to just replace the entire sender assembly. But a new one cost over $400. And like I said earlier, I want to keep this as budget-friendly as possible. So we're going to try and rebuild it by removing and replacing this pump here, as well as a little piece of soft hose that goes along with it. Now, some of our connectors are completely corroded over. We're gonna try and clean those and see how far we get. If we're successful, our repair costs will only be 18 bucks. That's what this pump kit costs. This comes with a new strainer, all the wiring, everything necessary to rebuild this guy here. So let's go ahead and just start taking it apart. All right, there's a pump. Really the only other thing we need removed is that right there. This is still questionable, but it's a lot better than it was. We've got our brand new pump installed, as well as our little piece of fuel hose that runs to the metal line. Now the pump we bought is just a generic, probably the main reason it was so cheap at just $18. But since it is a cheap generic, it's not completely plug and play. We're gonna have to wire up the power and ground wires, which is no big deal. We'll just go ahead and use a couple of these. This is a solder stick, and I originally found this trick on my friend Alex from Legit Streetcars channel. It's basically a butt connector combined with heat shrink, but in the center there's a little piece of solder so it makes connecting wires and wire repair super quick and effortless. All you have to do is slip it over one piece of your wire. Now we're going to go back here and twist our wires together and then we'll just slide it right over our connection with the little metal portion sitting dead in the center. I've got a heat gun here we just want to warm it up a bit. That's it. Our solder's melted. We're just going to wait a few seconds for it to cool down. And we've got a repair connection. We'll do the same thing on our ground wire here. I've got a little bit bigger of a connector since we've got three wires together. Man, are these things slick. Whoever thought to put a little piece of solder in the middle of the connector is a genius. And the pack I got here has a bunch of different sizes. They'll last a really long time and they don't cost any more than a standard set of butt connectors. So definitely check out Solder Stick. I'm gonna drop a link to them down in the description box if you're doing any wire repair. These are amazing. Now the professional way to do this would be to drop the tank from the bottom of the car and empty it out, clean everything. But like I said, we're trying to do things in an efficient manner and a quick manner. So I've got this right here. This is a liquid transfer pump that is specifically good with gasoline. You wanna make sure you're not creating any sparks. And the nice thing is it's just this long tube. So we can put it right to the bottom of this tank. We hit one button and it should just flow right out. There it is. Oh my goodness, it is gross. We filled up about one gallon here, a little bit extra in the bucket, and that worked out really well. You can see inside pretty much all the liquid is gone. We just left with a bunch of gross gunk and varnish. Now I want to put about a half a gallon of acetone straight in the fuel tank. 
Putting acetone straight in your fuel tank is one of those controversial topics online. Some people will tell you it will shoot your fuel economy to the moon. Others will say it will just destroy all the soft components in your fuel system. An acetone is a very strong cleaner that is extremely combustible. My hope is that it just liquefies all that junk in the bottom of the fuel tank and diluted with a bit of gas will just run through and basically burn up in the engine. However, there is no substitution for dropping the fuel tank and cleaning things the appropriate way. For the time being, I think it'll be okay just to get the Corvette running. And we'll top it off with a little bit of fresh gas. And before we go and drop the pump assembly back into the tank, I want to hook up the electrical connector to it so that we could test the pump, all of our connection and repaired wires and make sure it works. I'm going to go and put 12 volts to the car. The key is in the on position. All we're listening for is a whir that lasts a moment or two. All right, I'm sending battery power in three, two, I didn't hear anything. I think the ground points are too far corroded on the sender unit here to actually work. So we're gonna go and rig this up a different way. Now there's not a lot of consistency when it comes to cars and the color of wires that manufacturers use. It's not like a house plug, which generally has the same colors that identify the purpose of each wire. So to triple check that I was wiring up everything right, I went directly to the pump harness and used this multimeter to probe what I figured was the power and ground to the pump. When we apply battery power to the car, you'll see the meter jump from zero to power then back down to zero and that's exactly what we want as the car will send intermittent power when it wants the pump to turn on you see if i switch the red power probe to the other wire in this harness then apply battery power to the corvette it goes from zero to power and never shuts off that's because this is for the fuel level gauge which provides constant power when the car is on so to get a working connection without buying any additional parts i cut the wires at the top of the sender unit and connected them directly using solder sticks to the wires that run to the pump. Remember, we're only doing this to get the car running, and if this car was ever to be put back into regular use, the whole sender really needs to be replaced for a safe and long-term solution. All right, we're doing this test one more time now with our hardwired power connections. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. All right. That's exactly what we want the pump to come on, then go off, even while 12 volts is still connected to the car, which it is right now. Now remember those service records I found in the center console, I'm going to go through them really quick and I can tell you these will paint a much clearer picture as to why this car was likely labeled as flood total and given this junk title. Uh, now I want to make it very clear, I did not communicate with the previous owner of the Corvette nor any parties involved. All I did was review these and speculate and I'd like to hear what you guys have to say about these in the comments. Now, all of these pieces of paper pertain to one dealership trip around eight years ago. They start off by saying, customer states, the engine cranks over but will not start. And the tech found bad fuel in the system, damaging pump and injectors. Now, the mileage in on this trip was 3,201, so around 1,300 miles ago when this car had essentially the same issue that we're dealing with now. At the time this Corvette went to this dealer, it would have been around two decades old. So the dealer offered them what seems like pretty much every single routine service they offer. And uh, good for the customer, he declined the majority of them. I'm with him on that because a lot of these are DIY sort of things that you could do much cheaper. And uh, he did get a few extra things like a pair of wiper blades and a serpentine belt, which are good, again, considering the age of the car. But all in all, a set of new fuel injectors plus a fuel pump and sender assembly with installation cost him a little bit over three thousand dollars which sounds pretty reasonable being at a dealership now, i took some information off these service records i put them into google and i found a social media page and within this page there was a single photo with this corvette parked in the background alongside the car were things leaning up against it which tells me that this car was parked outside for probably most of its life. Now, the auction that I got this Corvette from was very close to the east coast of Florida. So think about it being parked outside, very close to the coast. Uh, that would explain why the tires are severely dry rotted and why there's a lot of corrosion on some of the aluminum surfaces under the hood. Now, from the auction photos, these are things you would have never picked up on. Not to mention all the tires were inflated in these photos. But you're buying a car that you know had one owner. It also only has 4,500 miles on the clock and it looks amazing. You can only imagine it was somebody's garage queen. This is not an unfamiliar story. How many times have you seen someone get super enthusiastic about buying something? And a lot of times a sports car. 
and they don't use it as much as they anticipated and as time goes on they use it less and less. I know it's something that I do frequently. Now remember, eight years and around 1,300 miles ago, this car went to the dealership to have its complete fuel system redone to the tune of around $3,000. And eight years sounds like a long time, but to the previous owner that had to pay that $3,000, it probably wasn't long enough for him to forget. So when he went out to the car to try and get it started, most recent time he did it, and the same thing happened, I'm imagining he figured that he was gonna be in for the same bill, Probably a bill that would be even worse because times have changed and someone down the line figured the best way to resolve this car's problem this time around was to just get insurance involved. At this point, I wanna hear from you guys. Why do you think this car was marked as flood total? Let me know down in the comments. Either way, I'm pretty confident we're gonna have this thing running in no time and it's gonna cost us nowhere near $3,000. All right, we're ready to go back in. The only thing I've added is this little fuel strainer, which will act like a pre-filter to catch any gunk before it goes up the pump. And then I've got a brand new gasket to seal it uh, in the tank. All right, we've got it all capped off and hooked up. Underneath the hood, we've got our fuel gauge hooked back up. And then I've got my jump pack here ready to send 12 volts to the car. The key is currently in the on position. So when we hook up the 12 volts, we should be priming the fuel pump. Now mind you, we haven't cleared out a fuel filter and this thing hasn't primed all the way through. But we are still building, look, just a little bit of fuel pressure. Not a lot, not a lot. But let's go ahead and turn that key again. Keep priming that pump and see if we can't build fuel pressure. Let's see what we got after doing that a couple times. Oh yeah, that's what we wanna see. This thing should start. How well it's gonna run is another story, but I'm betting it starts. We hear the headlights are moving. Let's see if we can't get this started. Three, two, one. It's not running half bad. Make sure everything is good under the hood. Oh yeah, listen to that. Not even any like smoke coming out of the tailpipe. It's running really, really good. Now listen to this. We did put the gunny wheels on just to move it. These are super slick, they're shop wheels. So they fit pretty much any make or model car, even those exotics with the gigantic ceramic brake calipers. Um, these work, but they've got solid tread on them, which means they'll never go flat, but then again, you don't wanna go more than a few miles an hour in them. And I don't know if I showed you, but the original wheels and tires on this car were so dry rotted because they are literally the original tires <laughs> that probably shipped on this car in 1995. So we'd need a separate set and the obvious solution is just to go and grab these off of the ZR1. However, the ZR1 actually works. Like that is an operable car and I don't wanna make it inoperable if I don't have to. So I have two other potential solutions I'm gonna try first. The first solution is behind the Ram truck. It is this C5 Corvette. This is actually not my car. This is Sage's project and it is currently in op like it is a legit in op we can't get it started and i think if anything is going to fit this is the closest in generation those wheels and tires should fit but i still have to jack the car up get the wheels off then put them back on later so you can find nice storage areas under these shady trees and here i've got a set of four wheels and tires off of a c7 corvette these are stock size i think the fronts are 18s rears are 19s so they're going to be a bit big for a c4 but bolt pattern is the same and i'm hoping that they'll fit.
All right, it is considerably hot out here. So I've got the AC blasting. Does it work? Does it work? Currently, it doesn't feel very cold, but let's just try and move this a few feet and see how far we make it. All right, come on, don't fail me now. Oh my gosh, running totally perfect. Oh yeah. The brakes, they sound crispy, but they, they work. All right. And we're on the road. So the Corvette runs. This is pretty unsurprising given that it has under 5,000 miles and it drives really excellent. While the brakes leave a little bit to be desired, there's not even a single light on the dashboard. This car is probably just a few thousand dollars away from being the closest thing to a new C4 Corvette I think anybody could find out on the open market right now. But as you saw, I took a lot of shortcuts in the methods I used to get it to work. And that's because, well, we're not going to put this car back on the road. We figured it might be a bit more profitable just to part it out. If this car had a clean title and was being offered on a site like Bring a Trailer, I'd imagine it might sell north of $20,000. But since it comes with flood branded paperwork, even though there's no real signs of a flood anywhere, uh, well, that severely diminishes its value. And now you're gonna be searching for this needle in a haystack buyer that wants to save money on a salvage C4 Corvette, but also wants the nicest C4 Corvette. But somebody looking for parts on a car like this, the opportunity to buy parts like a near mint interior or a super low mileage drivetrain, well, they'll snap them up in a heartbeat because, well, there's not a lot of cars like this being parted out. So the current plan for this one is to be shipped off to J&J Auto Wrecking, which is a parts recycling facility for enthusiast cars. They love buying C4 Corvettes. When I told them about this one, which is virtually perfect in an imperfect way, they were ready to go. Now this is a tentative deal, and I know there's gonna be a few of you guys that are not on board with it. So let me hear from you in the comments. I'm all ears. If you have some super creative idea or plan that we could do with this Corvette, well, I wanna know because uh, it is kinda special, but the ZR1 is just a bit more special than me, and I don't have a need for a second C4. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, be sure to give it a huge like. Also, make sure you're following me on Instagram where you'll find updates and new content there before anything goes live here on YouTube. As always, I wanna thank each and every one of you for watching today and I'll catch you very soon.